Professor McGuinness, thank you for uh, meeting with me today to discuss the idea of polycentric governance that is quite central to Eleanor Ostrom and Vincent, uh, Vincent Ostrom's uh, work. And so um, just to start us off, I wonder if you can talk briefly about the intellectual history of the polycentric governance concept. Hey, Daphne, thanks for um, inviting me to give you these um, responses to your questions. I'm glad that new generations of students continue to get uh, interested in the topic of polycentric governance, uh, which is indeed one of the key core concepts of the Bloomington School of Political Economy or Institutional Analysis that uh, uh, Lynn and Vincent Ostrom uh, uh, established uh, here in uh, IU Bloomington uh, by when they first established the workshop in, in 1973 as an independent research institution. Uh, the topic or the concept of polycentric governance, though, goes back a few years earlier uh, to 1961 when Vincent Ostrom uh, and Charles Thibault and Robert Warren, uh, who were all at UCLA at the time, uh, put together an article about trying to understand how metropolitan areas in the United States are governed. And at that time, there was a fair amount of uh, urban reformers who were advocating the consolidation of uh, the um, governance of uh, the, the public officials in central cities and suburbs and smaller cities and neighborhoods to consolidate themselves together, uh, to work together to provide public services like policing or water services or transportation in some sort of a consolidated sort of effort. And in fact, just a, an hour's drive north of um, Bloomington here in Indianapolis, uh, these, the capital city of Indiana, Indianapolis, consolidated with, uh, with um, uh, their entire county, and so Marion County, and so it was all one big governance system, which was what the reformers wanted. But um, Lynn and Vincent were coming out of a tradition of public choice and uh, public choice theory, which had, which had been developed in the 50s, with Vincent in particular playing uh, leading roles at the time, which emphasized the fact that markets tended to be more economically efficient than government operations and that they provided a, a wide amount of, of choice. Uh, Charles Thibault had in the mid 50s written a classic article that ended up being described as voting with the feet, although I don't think he actually used that term in the article, that would argue that um, citizens in a metropolitan area were better served if they had options, if they could go to different, live in different neighborhoods and different parts of the metropolitan area and um, vote together to establish, uh, you know, put more emphasis into clean, uh, uh, parks or into um, uh, quiet or police services of a certain kind or or safety or curfews. And so that the people in the in the area could congregate together into neighborhoods that would provide a different where the public officials would would provide a different package of public goods and services for that community than people in another community, other part of the area might want. And they were concerned that if you move to a consolidated system of governance, then the entire community would have to have the same kinds of public services throughout. And there wouldn't be that sort of freedom for people to move from one part of the community to another. And, and Charles Thibault argued that there was a way to replicate or mimic the effects of economic competition that you would have in markets by having multiple public officials multiple sets of public officials in different communities, and then the people could sort themselves into the kind of living environment they wanted by selecting which community they wanted to live in. And so you can kind of mimic the effect of, of private competition in, um, by having competition among public officials. This resulted in a lot of duplication and seemed like a lot of wasteful sort of spending, but it had advantages of providing services that, that the people liked better uh, and respected the differing tastes of different parts of the community. So uh, the notion of the polycentric governance was the, their effort to extend this or to generalize the voting with the feet argument into one where you didn't actually have to move to another neighborhood to get access to different kinds of services. So they were, it was a more abstract way of organizing uh, uh, the governance of the metropolitan area 
in a way that enabled uh, the same kind of public services to be provided by different providers in different in diff different parts of the community and to sort of mimic competition. And, and the basis of the argument was kind of a, a subtle economic argument, which was that public goods that, that individuals in a, in a community wanted to have access to a lot of different kinds of public goods, but it wasn't the case that all of those public goods could be um, efficiently produced and delivered at the same scale. You wouldn't want one fire department for the entire city, for example. Yeah, you know, but you might want, you said you would want small neighborhood sort of fire departments, but you may want a, a public transport system that, that did cover the entire region and not just one small neighborhood. So there was a range of scales of aggregation uh, that we should have. And so the notion of polycentric governance would be that there would be public authorities at different levels of aggregation that would be specializing in public services of, of different kinds based on when they could most efficiently put them together. So again, it's bringing this economic logic into the connection between uh, uh, citizens living in a metropolitan area and the way in which they were governed. Uh, and so they came up with this notion of polycentric governance and it's complicated. I'm not gonna have time to go through the, through the logic here. But um, one of the things that I've always found kind of amazing is that although this article from 1961 is sort of taken as the starting point of everything in the Bloomington School, it wasn't really that big a deal in the, in the policy literature. It, it did not play a major role in the urban politics literature. Uh, there was much more of an emphasis on consolidation or on urban regimes, a concern that, that businesses private business had too much influence over public officials and things like that. And so that was sort of the, the level of it was, come, it was coming into. But later by the 1980s, especially in the 1980s during the Reagan years in, 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 the, America, in the United States, uh, there was a big emphasis on trying to make governments operate more efficiently like markets. And so there was an emphasis on privatization of various sort of services, of deregulation of a lot of public services into uh, giving private corporations more leeway in delivering the types of public services that they wanted. And, and for many people, polycentric governance was kind of seen as an example of that, of, of privatization, of using too much market sort of logic. But that's not really the, the right way to look at it because it was, it was a very different kind of competition uh, that came into play in that. And, um, the Ostroms, uh, particularly under Lynn's guidance, when they when they got here in Bloomington in the mid nineteen uh, in mid nineteen sixty, uh, this concept was already out there, and this policy debate was already out there. And Lynn got involved in this comparison in different parts of uh, the areas in in Indianapolis. There were some communities in neighborhoods in Indianapolis that did not join the consolidated countywide system. And so they compared the services, excuse me, the performance of police services in those isolated sort of communities with similar neighborhoods across the streets that were part of the consolidated area. And they ended up demonstrating that there was indeed some improvement in citizen um, uh, appreciation or a positive assessments of the quality of the policing services they received if the police services were organized on the community level rather than on a county-wide sort of system. So this was an argument that uh, empirical evidence that there was a reason why having this very complicated overlapping kind of system uh, made more sense uh, in terms of uh, not efficiency in terms of economic cost, but effectiveness in terms of delivering the types of services to people uh, at the level that they wanted. And so the same logic uh, uh, Lynn in particular applied in her research, later research on uh, the management of common pool resources uh, in, in many parts around the world, where you had these communities that organized themselves uh, to um, put together rules to protect their local commons or local resource commons. And again, the, the argument was that, you know, incorporating those resource systems into national or global systems of resource governance was not 
might make economic sense in some cases, but but it really would not provide the same level of control and the same level of choice for the people on the ground. So polycentric governance has kind of been in this in this intellectual milieu, if you will, uh, between the effective the the appropriate roles of government in public policy uh, and the role of the private sector in public policy and how we can use one type of organization to mimic the effects, uh, the benefits of other um, sectors or, or to compensate for the effects. And so you get into these very complex and convoluted interacting relationships between private and public sector actors, which really has become in the 1980s and the 90s and beyond, the way of looking at public administration. It's, it's no longer seen as public administration being put on top of, of a private economic system or, or, or with community sort of organizations, but that they're all networked together in some sort of collaborative governance kind of structure. And ironically, what, what Ostrom, Tebow, and Warren did back in the 60s and was kind of ignored at the time, really turned out to be a forerunner of this understanding of network governance or cross-sector collaboration or collaborative uh, governance that is now the way in which public administrators think about their jobs. And so I, I fascinating that this was a um, uh, sort of a precursor of something that, that didn't really become really that effective until uh, many years later. And actually, Lynn and I uh, uh, managed to publish an article in Public Administration Review uh, where we talked about how this original idea of Vincent's uh, uh, with his collaborators back in 1961 started to resonate only 20 or 30 years later. Uh, and so um, uh, what then was, was made the Bloomington School really catch on was not the police studies that had been done in the 70s, but much more this common pool, pool resource work that Lynn was guiding in the, in the 80s and it ended up summarizing in her governing the commons, uh, which really got a lot of attention and encapsulated a lot of interdisciplinary research and held out a sense of hope that there was a, a way to, for communities to govern themselves without being incorporated into states or into markets. And then eventually, uh, Lynn was awarded part of the um, uh, 2009 to, uh, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, which really brought even more attention to uh, to this to this line of work. So, um, in in way, in some ways, the concept of polycentric governance is really a core concept in a rather it it addresses core problems of public policy, but it does it in a way that comes at it from a different direction than the traditional disciplines of both political science and economics. And so they tended to sort of fall between the cracks. Uh, and so it's, it's I, think I would say an important part of the intellectual history of this is that it was an intrinsically interdisciplinary research. It was interdisciplinary before that was the thing to do, before that was cool. Uh, and now all the universities around the country, around the world are trying to do interdisciplinary research. But when they set this up in the 70s, this was a very unusual uh, kind of setup and, and they kind of did it below the radar. And um, um, I'm not sure the IU administrators really knew what they were getting themselves in for uh, in supporting this kind of research. Uh, and as it turned out, it, 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 it really blossomed and, and it provided a lot of attention to, um, uh, to this body of research. So that's kind of a rough view of the intellectual history. Uh, if, that, if that's what you're looking for. Sure, thank you so much. I think that this uh, interdisciplinary foundation is really like one of the strands um, of the workshops. Right. Mm -hmm. As you have outlined the concept of polycentric governance, I think the concept might be um, quite challenging for the students who might be just learning about Eleanor and Vincent ideas. So when students have troubles uh, understanding this idea, Basically, um, when you're teaching about polycentric governance, how do you help your students understand your students understand what it is? Yeah, that the it's it's definitely challenging to explain, certainly in a short period of time in, in interviews. Uh, and so we make sure we have ways to get the students in a in a, in a classroom, uh, in a seminar, and and get them for um, uh, continued periods of time. That itself was kind of interesting because, you know. 
uh, Lynn and Vincent were both political scientists, but they weren't really doing political science in the way that political science was. They were also kind of doing economic policy, but they weren't economists. And so, you know, so the, 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 the courses didn't sort of fit into either the political science or the economics kind of curriculum. And so when they established the workshop back in 73, it wasn't just a research center. This is what made it different from a lot of the other research centers on campus. They also realized that it was going to have to be a place where students could get directly engaged in the kind of research that they were talking about and, and uh, that they would be able to provide their own context, you know, have their own building, their own area where they could teach their own courses to the students. Not an entire degree program because students would come in as either put science or economics or anthropologists or, or geographers or something like that. So they would be getting degrees in these other programs, but that there would be the, a couple core courses in this um, interdisciplinary approach to um, um, political economy that has come to be known as the Bloomington School or the, the Ostrom Workshop approach. And uh, uh, later on, they did establish a, uh, a joint public uh, policy PhD program uh, that involved courses in political science and in SPIA, what is now the O'Neill School of Public Environmental Affairs. Uh, and so that was a collaborative sort of project. But it, it really required students to, it really required a lot out of students who were, as you said, just starting out and they needed to fit themselves into one of the disciplines because they were going to be hired. There weren't many places like the workshop out there. So they were going to be hired by a political science department or, or a geography department or economics department or something like that. So they had to fit into that, but they also had to have this way of understanding the interdisciplinary approach to research that they were trying to build here. And from the very start, Lynn and Vincent realized the only way for students to get to know that is to get their hands dirty and get there and participate. So there was an emphasis on getting graduate students directly involved in the research projects from the get-go. I mentioned the policing studies in um, uh, Indianapolis. That was very much driven by student interest. There was a graduate seminar that Lynn was putting together uh, where she wanted to do an, an, about a uh, project on measuring public services in some particular area of public. She didn't really care what. So she didn't want to do water resources because she'd done that for her dissertation. It was sick, she was sick of that for a while. Um, and so some of the students in the course decided to do police studies. And so out of that seminar came this entire research program on police services and comparing the performance of police services in, in different metropolitan communities. And throughout that project, students, graduate levels, and at that level, even some, un, at that time, even some undergraduate students were full participants in the process. And I guess I should also point this out. The way that the Ostroms really got around this is they saw their workshop as a workshop. And so that the, the students were apprentice scholars participating in the program. It's just, they, they had in mind something like a, uh, you know, an, an artisan uh, uh, and, and they, they, were, they did some um, woodwork uh, on their own and they did work with some master woodworkers here in the Bloomington area. And they got a sense of how that works, how masters pass their 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 craft on to, um, um, uh, you know, their 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 next generation of their workers who come in as, as, and serve as as part of the uh, part of the team of apprentice workmen. And so they saw doing policy analysis as something like craftsmanship and trying to understand um, how you do this and how you do this well. And so. Uh, that was a big part of what was going on in the uh, in the seminars. Students were required to write research papers from the get go. I mean, you know, from the from the first semester uh, to lay this out, and and it really was an eye opening experience for a lot of students. You know, most of all their other seminars were more normal kinds of literature based seminars where you had to read a bunch of people's writings and you had to identify different different themes and make connections. But here you were, really had to dig your hands into this. And it, it really helped train students well for when they made that step beyond doing preliminary exams to where they actually had to do their own research because they'd already had some experience doing it. We had other students in the mainstream programs 
that did not have any experience doing much research until they were all of a sudden said, okay, now go write a dissertation. And you've read all this stuff, now go write a dissertation. So I really, they, it, it turned out that uh, uh, the Ostroms put out a lot of very fine students uh, over the years and the generations that this system has been run. And so it, it's kind of hard to articulate exactly how they got the students to that point, but it really was a matter of getting them started early and, and, and treating them as full participants in, in the research endeavor. Uh, and so, uh, yes, it's challenging and you never quite get past that, but you find ways to engage people's creativity and their own interest in, uh, in that, okay? Did you have another follow-up question on that or? Yeah, I just want to mention that I think like the name workshop is not accidental, right? Because like the Ostroms, they emphasized craft craftsmanship quite a lot in their approach. Very much so. Yeah, um, I also had a question about the challenges in the idea of full centricity, but I think you have already addressed it. So um, I think I just wanted to thank you for uh, taking time to meet with me today and to talk again about uh, polycentric governance. Okay. I well, thank you very much. And, and as I suspected what happened, the 15 minutes have gone pretty quickly. Uh, uh, and I'll um, uh, be happy to talk to you again at some other point for, for later questions. So thanks very much for this opportunity to, uh, to revisit some of the, um, my experiences here uh, at the Ocean Workshop. Thank you for meeting with me today. Right, thanks.